As a pastor, I not only stand up here and do the Sunday things, but I talk with you and often lots of other people who come my way. And for many people, there are quite many questions boil down to this. What good is God if he doesn't show up when you need him? In fact, one author, uh, Philip Yancey, quite a popular Christian author, not quite as popular as he was 15, 25 years ago. You know, he made, he made the comment that a lot of people say, well, Jesus is my friend, but if I had a friend with unlimited resources, unlimited money, unlimited power, if I had trouble making rent, I would think, well, I'll get a loan from my friend. Sometimes I ask Jesus for money and it doesn't come. Jesus is a particular kind of friend, and it's not exactly the same as the other relationships we have in our life. And this, this is a big cause of people walking away from the faith and from the church. And it's, it's not something that's trivial. I know people for whom maybe they had a child who was sick. And they prayed and prayed for their sick child, and they called the elders of the church to come and pray for their sick child. And, and maybe even the, el the elders anointed that child with oil, as per the passage in the book of James. And the whole church prayed for this child, and the child died. These kinds of issues present crises of faith. Or maybe there was a relationship that went astray. Or maybe there was a son or a daughter that went astray. Or maybe there is a persistent health illness or a persistent sin and you prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed and it didn't get better. And you get to the point of saying, look, what's the point with all this if it doesn't work? People want to say things like prayer works and then they'll show you these lists of ways in which they prayed and God answered. And then someone else will show a list of ways in which people prayed and God didn't answer. And so you'd say, hey, look, are we just playing a silly game? Many of us are one disappointment away from looking for a new God or for looking for, looking for a new religious service provider, from only trusting myself and my resources to make life work. Two weeks ago, we met King Ahaz. And Ahaz was a very religious king of Judah. Now, he might, in contemporary words, be called spiritual but not religious. Because there were high places and altars and religiosity throughout his kingdom. And if one god was good, three or four gods were better. And if one religious practice was good, five or six religious practices were better, and he let a thousand flowers bloom throughout his kingdom, and the Book of Kings didn't think much of it. And when the northern kingdoms came down and were attacking him, he got nervous, and so he sent a lot of money to the king of Assyria and said, come down and attack my enemies, and the king of Assyria did. And this saved him. And so he went and he copied the shrine that was in Damascus. And he made a copy in the temple in Jerusalem. And he remodeled the temple. So his spirituality that worked modeled clearly the spirituality of Assyria. And we see these same things happen today. Because what we find is that, well... If this religion works well for this celebrity that I love, then I'm going to follow that religion, and we see that all the time. But yet the Lord invited him, instead of reaching out to Assyria, to reach out and to begin to trust in the God of Israel, and he demurred. Because he knew this God of Israel was a jealous God and didn't like to share his people with others. So he declined in a sanctimonious way, and Judah survived, but eventually the northern kingdom did not. But all of this put God's mission at peril, God's mission that started way back with Abraham to make a people for himself. A little 
little boy doesn't want to be separated from his mama. <laughs> oh, Grandma's going to walk him out of the room. Can God make the challenge of God's mission is can he make for himself a holy people that doesn't act like the rest of the world, that doesn't just kiss up and kick down, that doesn't live my well-being at the expense of my weaker neighbors, a God that if you practice it in your heart, in the temple, in the center, will work out through the rest of your life unlike the God of the nations. And so we might wonder that Judea is going to wander away because Ahaz is a bad king and he's leading Judah in this way. But Ahaz, like all of us, won't live forever. And his son Hezekiah takes the throne. In the third year of Hoshea, son of Elah, king of Israel, Hezekiah, son of Ahaz, king of Judah, began to reign. He was 25 years old when he became king. He reigned in Jerusalem 29 years. His mother's name was Abijah, daughter of Zechariah. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, just as his father David had done. What Ahaz did, Hezekiah did the opposite. And you often see this between fathers and sons. The sons react to the father. And the further Ahaz went away from God, the further Hezekiah went towards God. He removed the high places, smashed the sacred stones, and cut down the Asherah poles. He broke into pieces the bronze snake Moses had made. For up to that time, the Israelites had been burning incense to it. They were very, very spiritual people. Hezekiah trusted in the Lord, the God of Israel. There was no one like him among all the kings of Judah, either before or after him. He held fast to the Lord and did not stop following him. He kept the commands the Lord had given Moses. The Lord was with him, and he was successful in whatever he undertook. He rebelled against the king of Assyria and did not serve him. From watchtower to fortified city, he defeated the Philistines as far as Gaza and its territories. But in King Hezekiah's fourth year, which was the seventh year of Hoshea, son of Elah, king of Israel, Salmanasser, king of Assyria, we read about this last week, marched against Samaria and laid siege to it. At the end of three years, the Assyrians took it. So Samaria was captured in Hezekiah's sixth year, which was the ninth year of Hoshea, king of, of Israel. That's how they told time, by what, how many years the king was into his reign. The king of Assyria deported Israel to Assyria and settled them in Hala and Gozen by the, by the Haber River and the towns of the Medes. This happened because they had not obeyed the Lord their God, but violated his covenant. All that the Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded. They neither listened to the commands nor carried them out. But in the 14th year of King Hezekiah's reign, now pay attention, this is 14 years later. So the Bible compresses all of this time. And everything Hezekiah had done seemed to be blessed by God. He took down all the high places and focused worship of the Lord only to the Lord in the temple. And the nation was thriving. And everybody thought, surely this is the right way because God is blessing him. But Sennacherib, king of Assyria, attacked all the fortified cities of Judah and captured them. So Hezekiah, king of Judah, sent this message to the king of Assyria at Lachish. I have, I have done wrong. Withdraw from me, and I will pay whatever you demand of me. The king of Assyria exalt, exacted from Hezekiah, king of Judah, 300 talents of silver and 30 talents of gold. So Hezekiah gave him all the silver that was found in the temple of the Lord and the treasuries of the royal palace. At this time, Hezekiah, king of Judah, stripped off the gold which he had covered the doors and doorposts of the temple of the Lord and gave it to the king of Assyria. In other words, Hezekiah, who had been so successful and so religious, lost his nerve. And when the king of Assyria was dismantling his kingdom, 
He pleaded and said, just, just leave me alone. And he sent all the money he had, hoping that the king of Assyria would take the money and withdraw. But as we saw last week, the king of Assyria had decided he was going to expand his empire. And so Assyria decided they were going to stay. Yes, Hezekiah, I'll take all of your money and I'll take your people too. The king of Assyria sent his supreme commander, his chief officer, and his field commander with a large army from Lachish to King Hezekiah at Jerusalem. They came up to Jerusalem and stopped at an aqueduct of the upper pool on the road to the washerman's field. They called for the king, and Eliakim, son of Hilkiah, the palace administrator, Shebna, the secretary, and Joah, son of Aphis, the recorder, went out to them. And the field commander said to them, Tell Hezekiah, this is what the great king, the king of Assyria, says. On what are you basing this confidence of yours? Now, if you pay attention to this story, you'll note that a lot of the language that we often use of God is the same language that the king of Assyria will use of himself. Because the question is, who is in charge here? Is the Lord in charge? Or is the king of Assyria and his gods in charge? And to everyone in the world, the king of Assyria is successful, and Hezekiah, Hezekiah is deluded because he trusts in this God, the same God that the northern kingdom kind of followed along with the other gods, and that didn't rescue them, so who will be in charge? You say you have the counsel and the might for war, but you speak only empty words. On whom are you depending? that you rebel against me. Look, I know you are depending on Egypt, that splintering reed of a staff which pierces the hand of anyone who leans on it, such as Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and all who depend on him. If you say to me, we are depending on the Lord our God, isn't he the one whose high places and altars Hezekiah removed, saying to Judah and Jerusalem, you must worship before this altar in Jerusalem? Notice what this man is saying. He, like Ahaz, is spiritual, but not necessarily very religious. And if one god is good, many gods are better. And if one shrine is good, many shrines are better. And you should let a thousand spiritual flowers bloom. So Hezekiah, your own policy of bringing all the worship here into Jerusalem the Lord is probably angry with you because the Lord must work like all the other gods and any attention is good attention. Come now, make a bargain with my master, the king of Assyria. I will give you 2,000 horses if you can put riders on them. That's a taunt, by the way. How can you repulse one officer of the least of my master's officials, even though you are depending on Egypt for chariots and horsemen? Furthermore, I have come to attack and destroy this place without word from the Lord. The Lord himself told me to march against this country and destroy it. Oh, Hezekiah, you think you hear from God? Well, God told me this. What makes you think God's listening to you and not listening to me. What makes you think you're hearing from God? I can hear from God just as much as you can hear from God. Don't you hear this when you're talking to people about spirituality? God can talk to anyone. How are we supposed to know what God says? Why would you be faithful when your prayers have clearly not worked? Why would you hang in there with this God or with this religion or with this relationship if clearly it's not working for you? Then Eliakim and Shebna and Joah said to the commander, Please speak to your servants in Aramaic since we understand it. Don't speak to us in Hebrew in the hearing of the people on the wall. Now get the picture here. They're out there meeting the commander outside the city. And everyone in the city who's probably eating the last of their stores comes up onto the wall to hear how the negotiations are. 
And the commander of the Assyrian army has terrified everyone because everyone is sure that the city is about to fall and they are going to be dead or slaves. And so he says, let's negotiate this in Aramaic, okay? Not Hebrew. We don't want everybody in the city to hear. But the commander replied, was it only to your master and to you that my master sent me to say these things and not to the people sitting on the wall who like you will have to eat their own excrement and drink their own urine? Then the commander stood and called out in Hebrew, hear the word of the great king, the king of Assyria. This is what the king says. Do not let Hezekiah deceive you. He cannot deliver you by my hand. Do not let Hezekiah persuade you to trust in the Lord when he says, The Lord will surely deliver us. This city will not be like, will not be given into the hand of the king of Assyria. Don't listen to Hezekiah. This is what the king of Assyria says. Make peace with me and come out to me. Then each of you will eat fruit from your own vine and fig tree and drink water from your own cistern until I come and take you to a land like your own, a land of grain and new wine, a land of bread and vineyards, a land of olive trees and honey. Choose life and not death. Do not listen to Hezekiah, for he is misleading you when he says, the Lord will deliver us. Has the God of any nation ever delivered his land from the hand of the king of Assyria? Where are the gods of these other nations? Who of all gods these countries have been able to save his land from them? How then can the Lord deliver Jerusalem from his hand? He's hoping the people will hear and march up to the temple and grab Hezekiah and put him to death and open the gates and say, Sure, take us to this wonderful land where we'll have everything we need. But the people remain silent and said nothing in reply, because the king had commanded, do not answer him. Contrast this story with the story we met, we read a, a while ago of Jehu, where the northern kingdom just collapses because everybody is just doing what is expedient, what works for them in the moment. Here are the people, they're conflicted at this moment, they're terrified, they know they're running out of food, they, they know that Assyria has dominated everything, they know they're as good as dead, and part of them wants to grab Hezekiah and throw him over the wall and surrender because at least they'll live, but part of them, part of them holds that maybe, somehow, all of the religious investment they have made won't go for naught. Maybe somehow, in some way, everything that they've hoped is true. So then the officials who went out to meet him took their clothes and tore it. When King Hezekiah heard this, he tore his clothes and put on sackcloth and went into the temple of the Lord. He sent it to his administrators to go get the prophet Isaiah, son of Amos. They told him, this is what Hezekiah says, this day is a day of distress and rebuke and disgrace when children come to the moment of birth and there is no strength to deliver them. Huh? He's giving a word picture because this is what they've seen. Sometimes women, maybe it's a breach, maybe something has gone wrong. Sometimes women try and try and try and try to deliver that baby and it doesn't work and the baby and the mother die. Hezekiah is saying, for the last 14 years, I cut down the high places. I got rid of the Asherah poles and the Baals. And we did what Moses said. I have sacrificed for the Lord and it seemed to be blessed. We have, we have poured all of this into trusting into God. And today it looks like this entire project will kill the mother and the child. And there'll be nothing but death. It may be that the Lord your God will hear all the words of the field commander whom his master, the king of Assyria, has sent to ridicule the living God and that he will rebuke him for the words the Lord your God has heard. 
Therefore, pray for the remnant that still survives because most of the nation has been eaten up. And Hezekiah knows this is the last day. And he remembers the story of God swooping in at the last minute and miraculously rescuing his people. And he wonders, will that day be today? But Hezekiah knows how unusual miracles are. He knows how strange it is and how rare it is for God to deliver. And so he wonders... Will I be like how many stories when the church has prayed and the person has died? Or will we be that one example of God saving the dead? Then the king's officials came to Isaiah, and Isaiah said to them, Tell your master, this is what the Lord says. Do not be afraid of what you have heard. Those words with which the underlings of the king of Assyria have blasphemed me. Listen, when he hears a certain report, I will make him want to return to his own country, and there I will have him cut down with the sword. Isaiah says a lot more. If you've ever read the book of Isaiah, you know he goes on a ways. But I'm going to skip that for the sake of time right now. So what happened was the commander then heard that Egypt was coming. And so the commander with, withdrew his army, but he sent a letter and said, I'll be back. Don't, don't think that you're saved. I'm going to come back with my army. So then Hezekiah gets the letter and he goes back to the temple. Then he went up to the temple of the Lord and spread it out before the Lord. And Hezekiah prayed to the Lord, Lord God of Israel, enthroned between the cherubim. You alone are God over all the kingdoms of the earth. You have made heaven and earth. Give ear, Lord, and hear. Open your ears, Lord, and see. Listen to the words Sennacherib has sent to ridicule the living God. Lord, if there's any time to show up, show up now. It is true, Lord, that the Assyrian king has laid waste to these nations and their land. They have thrown their gods into the fire and destroyed them, for they are not gods, but only wood and stone, fashioned by human hands. Now, Lord our God, deliver us from his hand, so that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that you alone, Lord, are God. Right there is the mission statement of the Old Testament. The purpose for the plagues. The purpose for the deliverances. And Hezekiah says, Lord, this is the moment. Show the nations the truth. That night, the angel of the Lord went out and put to death 185,000 in the Assyrian camp. When the people got up the next morning, there were all the dead bodies. So Sennacherib, king of Assyria, broke camp and withdrew, and he returned to Nineveh and stayed there. One day while he was worshiping the temple of the god Mizrach, his sons Adramelech and Sharazezer killed him with a sword, and they escaped into the land of Ararat, and Esarhaddon, his son, succeeded him as king. Now, these are the stories we love the Bible for. Things got to the, the bitter end and God showed up and they were delivered and they had a happy ending. But you know, there's always another crisis and there's always another army and there's always another moment. Allegiance and faithfulness were rewarded, but we live our lives in moments of consciousness where there's always another trial that comes, and, and we'll pray this prayer again. And we'll need God to bail us out again. And, and, and we, are, we live in this moment, and we're tried again and again, and we wonder, will God show up? Faith is tested, refined, and strengthened. This, of course, is what happens with Jesus and his disciples. Because Jesus, the soldiers come to take him. And Peter, who had vowed that this would never happen, drew a sword and cut the ear of the high priest's servant. And we would expect Jesus, who could bring sight to the blind, anyone with a pointed stick, 
can take sight from those who have sight. But who of us can restore sight to the blind? Jesus could. And he could, with a word, raise the dead. And with a word, still the storm. Surely Jesus could take out a squad of soldiers with a word. But instead of protecting himself and protecting his disciples and protecting his people and protecting his mission, Jesus heals the high priest's ear. And Jesus goes along with his being arrested. And when Jesus is before Pilate, Jesus could have just said, hey, you know, I'm not trying to bring down the Roman state. And Pilate could have said, yeah, I can see that. You haven't caused any trouble at all. There's no reason to execute you like your countrymen are demanding. But Jesus doesn't even do that. And so the disciples have their Hezekiah moment and they're probably praying when Jesus is arrested and saying, Lord, deliver Jesus because he's a good man and everything we've worked at is on the line. And God doesn't show up. And when Jesus is being crucified, he himself cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So, yeah, is this Hezekiah story nice? Yeah, but all those times we've prayed and God hasn't shown up, they haunt us and we wonder. Everyone is a theologian. Jesus' enemies said, see, God didn't deliver him. He was unrighteous. And today, people say, see, God isn't real. All you have is political, military, and economic power. The suffering believer sits there in their agony and asks, does he hear? Does he answer? Will he deliver? Can he deliver? Will things just continue to slide? But then, of course, you have Easter. Did Jesus rise from the dead? If he did, what does that mean? Does that mean that through it all, God will win? What if he didn't rise from the dead? Then what are all the losers of history left with? But if he did rise from the dead, how is the story changed? My question for you is, are you a mercenary believer? Do you believe in God when it works? And when it doesn't work, do you decide to believe in something else? Because if you are, then I'll tell you who your God is. Your God is the outcomes that you are trying to engineer in your own heart and life. Is your allegiance to God in Christ dependent upon getting what you get out of it now. And the now is critical. Now we know that a couple of hundred years later, Jerusalem will be taken. The temple will be destroyed. God's people will go into exile and be mixed up with all the other people just like the northern kingdom was. But somehow that doesn't end the story. And so we begin to wonder, what game is God playing? What are his goals? How does he work? We always imagine that he only works through us getting what we want, when the truth is, so often, he does his greatest work when he doesn't seem to show up. When he doesn't seem to answer when he doesn't seem to deliver. Well, what could he be doing? I don't know. But then it all boils down to, can you trust him? That's been the question all along. Can your trust endure? Is your trust durable? Or are you a mercenary? What is this faith good for? Here's the question. What can't you endure if you believe Jesus? What loss can't he redeem? What pain can't he turn to glory? What fear can't he turn to joy? The 
because here's the reality. Next week, actually not next week, but the week after, we're going to see Hezekiah do the whole thing all over again. The prophet's going to come to him and say, you're going to die. And Hezekiah says, no, I don't want to die. Will God listen? What will that mean? Will more life stop the cycle? Ask yourself the last crisis when you brought to God and said, Lord, if you don't show up now, think about the times he did show up. Did everything get resolved? Maybe he's working on something deeper than you know. Something that even physical death in this world doesn't finally resolve one way or another. Maybe you are more than just the sum of your needs and crises. Maybe he's asking that you trust. Let's pray. Lord, this question scales for us in large and small ways. We see the crises of others that feel existential. We might look at them and say, oh, they're being dramatic. But when it comes to us, well, then it's existential. Lord, so often it boils down to the question, do we trust you? We might blithely say we trust you with our death when death isn't close. But we struggle to trust you with our life and the ups and downs that are always in it. Lord, you who saved Hezekiah did not rescue your son from the temple guard or from the Roman Empire and allowed him to be crucified and then raised him, so the scriptures say. And the scriptures say that you will raise us. Do we believe you, Lord? Lord, give us your Holy Spirit that we might believe. Give us your Holy Spirit that we might trust. Hear our prayer. In the name of Jesus, amen. Would you stand?